Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. And now, your host, Dustin Jones. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. Thank you for the download, and I'm very excited for you to meet my good friend, Tim DeFrancesco. He's a physical therapist, athletic trainer, and head strength coach for the Los Angeles Lakers. He is probably the absolute last person you'd expect to come on to a geriatric rehab podcast, but I wanted to bring him on because he uh, has a very good perspective on what he does as a strength coach. Uh, He's actually... Uh, one of the big reasons why I got into home health PT, uh, ironically, he gave me some advice during a transition that led me to choose home health, and I kind of indirectly fell in love with it. But it, what he has learned throughout his career, working with some of the best athletes in the world, is that those principles that that get uh, Kobe Bryant, D'Angelo Russell, and Nick Young, and all these players that he works with, uh, what gets them strong and fast can also get older adults strong and fast as well, scaled appropriately. So uh, we dive into just the lessons learned and applications uh, for us, for you, for me, the geriatric rehab clinician. So this will be a very useful conversation for you. This is part one of two. We we broke it up, went for about an hour long. So we're going to have two roughly 30-minute episodes. Uh, before we get in, into the interview, I did want to mention a workshop that Tim is going to be doing. He didn't mention this uh, in the interview. But he's doing a workshop July 19th at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on landing your dream job. He gets dozens of emails a week about, you know, how do I get your job? How do I get uh, to work with an NBA team, an NFL team, Major League Baseball team, wh- whatever it may be? Um, and I-, I want to share this on the Senior Rehab podcast because his career advice is not specific per se, to professional athletics. I mean, some of it will be, but a lot of it will be applicable to just getting a lovely job that you will enjoy, that will be fulfilling, uh, and and that you know, you'll know you love, hopefully, you know, for the rest of your life. So check it out, tdathletesedge.com forward slash workshops. It's on July 19th at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I don't think you'll regret it. So without further ado, let's get into this interview with Tim DeFrancesco with the Los Angeles Lakers. Timmy DeFrancesco, welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. I appreciate your time. Psyched to be here. Let's do this. Yes, sir. So you normally, uh, you know, do, you've done a bunch of podcasts, but you normally talk about that boring stuff with, you know, high-level athletes and working with an NBA team called the Lakers. But today, we're going to talk about a topic that I know is near and dear to your heart, and that's geriatrics. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. That's that's right up at the top for me. Exactly. That's what I figured. So let's... Uh, Let's get the quick and dirty of your career from, you know, the beginning of, of athletic training all the way up to, to where you're at now. All right. So undergrad for me, I, I knew going into uh, undergrad, um, I, was, I was looking for sports medicine. I was looking specifically at that time for, for athletic training, and that morphed within probably my – by my sophomore to to junior year into feeling like I wanted to expand my toolbox for athletes and, and, and population of, of people that I could, uh, serve and, and would have the skill set to serve. So, um, physical therapy was, was really attractive, uh, in, in the sense that it would really, um, expand the evaluation and assessment, um, rehab skill set of, of my toolbox. So went immediately from, from undergrad athletic training to, um, uh, where undergrad athletic training program for me was at Endicott college in, in, uh, on the North shore of, of Boston. And then, uh, Mm -hmm. went, yeah, there you go. Got to, (laughs) got to give one out to the goals. Yes. Uh, so from there went into directly to UMass law for, um, to get my doctorate in physical therapy. And, um, uh, as I was going through that program, my mindset really, and my, my passion was, was more and more drawn to the high performance, um, strength and conditioning world of, of what was 
at the time, I, I think with with the work that the Mike Boyles and the Gray Cooks um, and and the and and that group of of I mean, whether you want to call it the the Mount Rushmore of of mm-hmm. what our profession um, in the in the sports performance world is now, I mean, they they were they were really coming onto the scene in a way that. Um, lots of other great experts in that area had, but, um, had already, had already done great work and had already done, um, so much for the, for the profession, but they were entering into this world of the internet and, Mm. and social media and, um, blogs and, and all this stuff could now be shared so easily and, and so widely that, um, you know, they, they were, really responsible for, um, I think starting what we have now of, of a, of a really expansive, passionate community of sport performance, strength and conditioning professionals. Um, so I think they really piqued my interest. And, and then it was, for me, it was like, well, how am I going to take this three year, um, doctorate in physical therapy, curriculum and then have that help me and serve me better in the sport performance strength and conditioning world. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, what I explored and that's what I had fun with for the next, um, after graduating and, and during my first three, three to five years working professionally as a physical therapist, um, really trying to, uh, sort of blend all of that together to be, uh, be able to serve the people I was working with, Mm -hmm. To, to the best of my abilities. Um, so, so much for being quick and dirty after, uh, <laughs> what was that? A, a 30 minute explanation of, uh, how I, how I went to school for a few years and, and, uh, got a couple of extra letters after my name and, and, uh, love, love sport performance and strength and conditioning. Yes. Hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. So you mentioned, you know, three to five years, uh, you know, you're at, what was it? Was it peak? Peak performance, physical therapy, Swamp Scott, Massachusetts. Shout out to Jimmy Cantor. Hope you're listening. <laughs> we'll have to make sure Jimmy listens to this. I, I'm, We're going to have to get that, him on the Yeah. So tell me about uh, PT school for you because you, you kind of went in with this bent towards sports performance. Um, what what was that like when you, you, know, you were taking all these other classes that you, you did, probably didn't necessarily perceive – uh, that they would help you down the road. But, you know, some of those classes that, you know, some, most of us go through that's like, I'm never going to use this stuff, you know, and you just kind of check out. What what was PT school like for all all those kind of classes you weren't as interested in? Yeah, you know what, though? I, I mean, I, I think that's typically the, and and even in my lengthy description of what my path was, I, it may not have been really clear. I mean, I think that people assume for me that PT school was just like, let me, let me, um, let me knock this out so I can get into where I want to go of, of sport performance and strength and conditioning. But I didn't really recognize that until that, that didn't sort of shift, um, in that direction until I would say even after PT school where, um, I, I, it wasn't until after PT school even that I uh, sat for the CSCS exam and, and really mm-hmm. began to dig into that. Um, I, I, I really looked at physical at, at PT school as my avenue into working with populations beyond um, athletes mm-hmm. and and and. While I was in PT school, I really saw myself as, you know, the future doctor of physical therapy working with um, not just athletes, but, yeah. but, but working with in, in, in the rehab setting and, and with all different age groups and, and um, uh, you know, pathologies and so on and so forth. So, um, so I really – I think for – just like any of us though, I, I think there were parts of, of your academic career where you, you're, whether it's a, a, you know, geometry class or, or whether it's a neuro PT class or, mm-hmm. um, orthopedic PT class, 
that you're like, well, this isn't going to be the, the area or the, the niche that, that I'm going to be in. So just kind of glaze the eyes over and, and get through it. I mean, certainly I had that, but I was also open, um, and, and kind of had a little bit of fun with seeing like, well, I don't really see myself being as working as a, a neurophysical therapist for the rest of my life. But I'll tell you what, there's some things here that I could see an athlete benefiting from. Mm. And, and I didn't really know how to put that all together, but that's, you know, what we now see with athletes working primitive patterns into their yeah. workouts and their, and their prehab and, and, and their corrective activities all the time now. Um, you know, I, I didn't know how that would all play out and, and look, but, but I, it was interesting to me to see like, well, what can I get out of this that I would apply to the specific area that I, I would be in? Hmm. Man, I wish I would have had that perspective back in PT <laughs> school. Cause I, yeah, I just think of, yeah, just some of those classes and, you know, honestly it was, you know, any class where I was working mainly, you know, with an older adult population, which is, you know, very ironic now, but I would just check out and be like, you know, I don't, I don't even want to learn this stuff. I don't see how it's going to, you know, benefit me down the road. And, and now I look back and just like, man, a lot of this stuff, you know, can be applied across, you know, ages, age groups, uh, different diseases, different injuries, you know, it's, it's very applicable to different types of people, but I definitely didn't have that perception. Back yeah, I, I think that just speaks to how selfish I am. I was just looking for what I could <laughs> get out of that scenario for what I needed it for. Yeah, uh, figures, <laughs> figures too. What uh, what clinicals did you have? Um, so I I worked in um, I had several hospital based clinicals. Uh, one of them specifically neuro PT and and um, and then one of them orthopedic um, and. Uh, and then I also had, uh, another one that was in more of, uh, uh, sports medicine based, uh, PT outpatient clinic. So, um, kind of ran the gamut a little bit and, and, uh, uh, it was, I think it was really helpful for me to see those different environments, um, and, and see how, uh, I'll tell you what, I mean, I, I, I just, the, the, the people in those hospital based settings that I was able to get experience in Mm -hmm. specifically the the level of appreciation that they have for what you're, for the smallest things that you're able to, to provide them with or, Mm. or, or serve them by, um, that's something that I'll never forget. And I, I always, um, I Give always, us an example. Do you, do well, you remember a specific story? Yeah. I mean, I, I do. I think, I think there was, uh, it, it killed my, my, um, my CI. I mean, but I basically spent like the whole next half hour that we were supposed to be seeing like two other patients just, talking with a, a, a patient and, and helping her eat her, um, her meal that had been just brought to her, hmm. um, really didn't do anything from a physical therapy quote unquote standpoint. But, um, you know, my CIs out there like writing some extra notes and like, okay, mm-hmm. now we're behind for the day. And she was, <laughs> she was phenomenal. And she, she, after the fact said to me, you know, what, what, what just went on there was, was probably more beneficial at this very moment than any physical therapy skills that you could have, Mm. um, implemented. And, and, you know, but I I mean, I, I, the person like, you know, we, we hugged it out after that, that, uh, you know, after that 30 minutes of just, uh, um, getting that terrible hospital food Mm. down, down, uh, down and, and having a good chat. And, um, and it put me and my CI behind for the day, but it was, it was something that stands out for me as that was, that was a really productive day at the, Mm. at the hospital. That's awesome. Uh, I think of many occurrences as well. I I think the biggest thing that I've, I've noticed when, you know, when you're telling that story 
uh, is just the simple fact of getting someone outside, especially someone yeah. that's in like a skilled nursing facility that, you know, it's for some people it can basically function as a prison <laughs> in terms of not, yeah. you know, being able to get out of the room. They're very dependent yeah. on other people. And, you know, just to, instead of taking them down to the gym, but just taking them outside and, you yep. know, whether you're walking, standing, doing whatever, you know, treatment plan you had, you know, planned out for the day, but just getting out, uh, you know, taking the time to do that is super impactful for sure. Totally agree. What, um, so when, when let's go to that neuro, uh, rotation. So when, when you all were doing kind of, you know, the, the typical treatment session with your patients, what, what was your perception of that? Um, it's, you know, I have to kind of scroll back to that that point it was yeah. uh uh but but i i think i think i was at the time more more intrigued by by the process and by the um you know the the small uh gains that that are almost hard to see on a day-to-day basis mm. in in that setting yeah um it's 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 not a setting necessarily, and and this is my inexperience speaking because again, I, I really have only been in that environment in in like a, a student yeah. clinical setting. But like my my takeaway and perception was, um, you know how how impressive it is that these these patients, um, these these people working through this. Um, these challenges um, are, you know, how, how hard they have to work for for the for for such small and sometimes hard to see gains that mm. that eventually can really build up and and become something powerful. But it's it's the day in day out of that process is 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 a real grind. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, you know, we're not talking about. A, a wrist fracture that for like a few weeks you 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 have to work really hard to flex and and extend the wrist. I mean it's 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 a lot more than that. And and so um, I I think that that was my takeaway. My perception was just being impressed, mm. you know, with with the the not only the the patient's grind that is required within that. Environment. I use the term "grind" really positively. I mean, yeah. that the grind is what makes us. I mean, it, you know, and and so, but both the patients' grind that's required in, in that environment, and that, and and also the the therapists. I mean, it takes a it takes a really special person on both sides of that that coin to to really do special things in that in that environment. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So now, you know, with the experience you have, you know, working, you know, with some of the, you know, the best athletes in the world in in some regards, the lessons you've learned working with these, these individuals, these freaks of nature, if you will, uh, those lessons that you've learned, how, what do you think would translate back into that type of setting? What, what lessons would you take with you if you were to go back, you know, into, you know, neuro rehab hospital or even acute care? Right. I mean, I, I think, I think if first it has to start with the idea that, um, that story about how I, I set my CI and myself behind for the rest of the day, just by having a conversation and and having a, a, you know, a meal with a, with a patient. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's the same deal. Like, so what if the person on the other side is, is Kobe Bryant, Kobe Bryant, Pau Gasol, or, or Steve Nash? Mm-hmm. You know the the if if you're going to accomplish um, physical and or you know performance based enhancement or um, you know rehab based work with that person, you're going to need a relationship. At, and, and a, a connection with that person mm. if you, if you want to really get some good stuff done. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's probably the first thing that stands out for me is, is, 
you better you better be able to relate to this person no matter what their background is where they're where they're trying to get to and what level they're at mm. it, it it doesn't matter if you can't if you can't talk and and be in the room comfortably with that person and and they look forward to that interaction um forget it forget everything yeah. i mean i it, 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 i don't care who you're working with or what you're trying to accomplish mm. that 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 piece of it is really important um and and uh, and I had great CIs and I had great um, you know professors and people that were able to um, I had great people my parents and 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 friends and family that I, I grew up around even beyond academic um, experiences that I think really ins- were were instilling in me on the on the along the way like <laughs> start there. Mm. Just, just, just get the grasp the ability and the skill set of communicating and enjoying another person's company, mm. and 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 if if you can do that, then <laughs> you know, I mean, unless unless you want to, unless you're you're talking about where you know you're setting yourself up for a career where all you do is stare at a computer, um, <laughs> you're you're gonna need that skill set more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I, I think then from, so that's sort of like the, um, philosophical and kind of, uh, uh, human side of, of how the, the two are absolutely related mm-hmm. of where I'm at now and where I was, you know, in rotations or clinicals yeah. during school. But then, um, the, the physical side as well it's 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 really it's it's all the same stuff i mean it's 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 you're just trying to assess where the individual is at in their um in their performance spectrum in their their physical ability um journey of of their life i mean their goals are probably different their specific uh, levels that they're at are, are, are different, but, um, I mean, that, it just comes down to the principles that we're, we're talking about mm-hmm. are, are the same. I mean, I, I need yeah. to, I need to teach, um, D'Angelo Russell how to, how to be aware of where his pelvis is and how to, um, keep it, that in a neutral position when he trains with me doing hex bar deadlifts Mm -hmm. the same way as I did with somebody who's in a hospital bed with X, Y, or Z pathology and is trying to set the foundation for a strong rehab process. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think that kind of loops back to this year perspective in PT school you know, just seeing how all those classes, even though you may not have been as interested, uh, but they, they do apply at some point. And yeah. it's just our, our skill level to, you know, scale those principles appropriately to that individual we have in front of us. Did, did you, uh, did you see the power of that, of connecting and building that relationship uh, prior to the Lakers? Was that yeah. as big of an yeah. emphasis to you? Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, um, it, I, I, I think I, I think I, I've always felt like if if I can, you know, that that's just because again, my my upbringing and the people I had around me to show me how important that was. I've I've always valued that in in any setting, and yeah. and. Um, I think also my experience as an athlete um, on a on a team in a team setting mm-hmm. also sort of reinforced that I, I I you know played basketball uh, in a small you know at Endicott as we mentioned and and small Division three school but um, outside of Boston and and um, so I think my experience as an athlete also. If, if you're going to excel in that setting, you would better be able to communicate and develop strong relationships and bonds with your, with your teammates. I mean, if, if that's 
you see teams that are, um, you know, struggling to reach their potential on TV at, at the highest level. And, and you can usually trace that back to fractured relationships and, and, and lack of communication and, and those types of things. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, yeah, for sure. I, 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 and maybe it was because I just am, you know, my lack of, of actual, uh, technical skills and everything else in my life are so bad. I knew that was the only thing I could do was, was, uh, be around people and, and, and communicate really well and, and, and enjoy my, my time and, and develop relationships with them. And so I, I just figured I better get really freaking good at this, <laughs> this skill. Cause I, I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm no good at everything else. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. I'll attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but I will, uh, you mentioned your, your friends and family, um, your mother who is near and dear to my heart and your brother. Uh, you, you definitely see that in, in the family of just, you, you all don't know any strangers. I mean, every, you could have a drink with anyone right. literally. Right. And, right. and that, that is, uh, that is a skill. And it makes me think of, uh, my PT school roommate, John Smorrell, if he's listening to this, uh, he, he could connect with anyone within five minutes and he could be the worst clinician ever. He's not, he's a good clinician, but he could be the worst ever. Sure. But his ability to connect with people, uh, just overcome so much. And it, it's cool to see, there's even some research now kind of backing that up of that patient therapist relationship of how that, you know, that could be a pretty good predictor of outcomes. Yeah. And, yeah. and that just fascinates me. Um, and hopeful for me because, I feel like I can connect with people, but you know, like you, like you said, you know, I'm I'm pretty dumb when it comes to the clinic. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna bank on on just building relationships and having some beers with my patients and hoping they get better. So Hey man, simple is simple is better. I you know, and and uh I I just see that more and more the the further I I go the it, I mean, I'm, I'm still very early in my professional career, but it's, it's, uh, you always hear as a student, you know, well, what, what are the secrets to being a great pro at, at this, per, you know, at this, in this industry or whatever it is. And mm-hmm. people throw that around, like, just keep it simple, um, you know, and, and simple's better and, and all that stuff. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But what are the real secrets? And, and, you know, it's just, it, you got to go with what works. Yeah. Hit me. Thank you for listening to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The show notes for this episode and much, much more can be found at SeniorRehabProject.com. If you found value in this conversation, please share this with one other person that could benefit. And until next time, do not forget to stay funky. Stay funky.